Hi, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Simon Timpley from the International Food Safety and Quality Network. Welcome to edition 63 of the Food Safety Fridays webinar program. Uh, I'm delighted today to say today our um, speaker is Kathleen Wyborn, Director of F&B USA Canada for DNV GL Business Assurance. And today Kathleen is going to be uh, talking to us about food fraud. Um, what is food fraud? Hmm. Yeah, anybody know? How does food fraud fit into the big risk? Yeah, that's important. And of most importance, what can we do about it to mitigate that risk? So it's, um, Kathleen's going to be uh, giving us some tips today and some understanding of the subject that might help us to uh, mitigate those risks and become a safer food business. Um, just like to say that the Food Safety Fridays webinar program is sponsored. Uh, we bring you free education regularly uh, and you get a free certificate of attendance. Um, and the sponsors are Safe Food 360, AIB International, Trace Analytics and Metal Toledo. You'll see their logos on the certificate. So thanks very much to the sponsors. And also thanks very much, obviously, to the speakers. Uh, and I'd like to introduce you at this point to Kathleen, if you can just switch your webcam on, Kathleen. Are you there, Kathleen? I'm sure yeah. you are. Hi, Hi Kathleen. Well, nice to see you. It's great to have you with us. Um, I, I know you was at, at Food Safety Fridays back in the fall of last year. That's right, isn't it? Yes. Uh, and it, it's it's good to see you again. And uh, we're really looking forward to your presentation. Wait, just tell the ladies and gentlemen where you're dialing in from today. Okay. Um, I'm based out of a suburb of Chicago and I'm in our office today in Oak Brook, Illinois. So we're a, a, a warm, um, about 15 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's a little bit chilly today. Yeah. As, as the, hurricane, the hurricane's not anywhere near you. Is it Hurricane Doris, the latest one? Have you heard no, of no, 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 no. We're, we're way north, way north in right. the US. Well, apparently it's heading over to us for the weekend just to spoil our weekend. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, if you can get your slides ready, uh, Kathleen, I'll just tell the ladies and gentlemen about next week's webinar. Right. Okay. Next week we've got Vladimir Suchinsky, uh coming back. He's presented lots of times and he's going to be giving us some tips on uh, defining smart goals in food safety planning. So you can register in the sidebar. Um, if not, respond to the email. I'll be back for the Q&A later. And also we've got some polls, so I'll be joining in with that. So for now, I'll hand you over to the capable Kathleen Wybom. Okay, Kathleen, over to you. Thank you. Can you hear me okay, Simon, per then, yeah. right now? Per perfect, okay. yeah, we can see your slides. Okay. Me and we can Fantastic. Well, again, welcome everyone. Um, I can see from, um, the chat bar here we have people from all over the world so I'd like to say good morning good afternoon and actually good evening to some um, thank you for taking the time to join this morning um, for this information what I'm going to be speaking about is on food fraud and um, as Simon said the types of food fraud um, some mitigation strategies and really what's um, what's going on in the world around food fraud um, the learning objectives is to give you a big picture um, about how food fraud fits into the risk matrix around the food and beverage industry, for you to gain an overview related to food fraud in the certification standards. Um, I work very closely with uh, the GFSI and have been on many of the technical working group committees, including the um, guidance document, which um, food fraud was um, written into with the help of a think tank and uh, big support from experts in the industry around food fraud. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. Um, identify the relevant key items within the European legislation and also to help you learn about risk mitigation acti activities, including vulnerability assessments, risk assessment methodology, how to control them in a search control. So, I will get into um, a lot of different information um, at certain certain levels of detail, um, but within this presentation, you'll see a lot of references 
to where you can find out a lot of information. And there is a wealth of information about food fraud actually on the internet. So if you take time to look into this, um, I think you'll find it very informative and the information that's available um, out there is, is great. So starting out, what is food fraud? And is this something new or has this been around for a long time? And actually looking back in history, um, back in the 1700 BC in Babylon, the code of Hammurabi, um, he, he was the first to um, actually look at food fraud and he wrote, written, wrote it into law. And the, he was the sixth king of the Babylon dynasty um, where on a seven and a half foot slate and clay tablets, it's written in a code. If a wine seller does not receive grain as the price of a drink, but if, if she receives money by the great stone or make the measure for drink smaller than the measure for corn, they shall call that wine seller to account and they shall throw her into the water. So back 1700 BC, in ancient Roman Athens, there were laws regarding the adulteration of wines with flavors and colors. And in the Midwest, in the mid 13th century in England, there was a guideline prescribing a certain size and weight for each type of bread, as well as the ingredients it should have and how much it should cost. So it goes on and on. And then in the 1900s in the US, Congress passed both the Meat Inspection Act and the original Food and Drug Act, prohibiting the manufacturer in interstate shipment of adulterated and misbranded food and drugs. So you can see this has not um, just started yesterday, but it's been around for a while. Um, what is food fraud? In the EU, there's really no definition of food fraud, but the fraudulent or deceptive practices mentioned in the Reg 178-2002, Article 8. In the, US, in the USA, the FDA adopted a working definition of economically modified adulteration. And I will have throughout my presentation, um, EMA, which is economically modified adulteration, which is the fraudulent intentional substitution or addition of a substance in a product for the purpose of increasing the apparent value of the product or reducing the cost to the production. And this is purely for no other reason but economic gain. Fraudulent intentional substitution, dilution or addition to a product or raw material or misrepresentation of the product or material for the purpose of financial gain by increasing the apparent value of the product or reducing the cost of its production. And this is the BRC, the British Retail Consortium, Food Edition 7, 2015 um, definition. Food fraud can also be defined as committed when food is deliberately placed on the market for financial gain with the intention of deceiving the consumer. And that's from the past 96 document. And then from um, John Spink and um, Moyer from the Michigan State University, um, which I think is a very good definition of food fraud. Food fraud is a collective term used to encompass the deliberate and intentional substitution, addition, tampering, or misrepresentation of food, a food ingredient, a food packaging, or false or misleading statements made about a product for economic gain. So it gives you um, a much broader, maybe, um, statement around what encompasses all of food fraud. Looking at the risk matrix that we deal with within the food in industry, there is, you can really slice it down the middle and looking at the actors that affect um, food. So there's the intentional side and there's the unintentional. And the intentional side is, um, with food fraud is again, strictly for motivation is gain. So it's the economic motivator. In food defense, it's it's to harm. It's um, terrorism into the food industry. And these are all intentional adulterations. And then on the other side, we have the unintentional, the things that happen, um, let's say, um, environmental conditions that affect um, food safety or food quality. Um, but it, again, these are accidental. So again, I want to give you a framework of risk to the, to the food industry. 
And we're going to focus, though, on food fraud, which is, um, again, the, the top um, circle around the intentional adulteration. And again, it's um, people know what, what's going on with this. And with food fraud, it typically is um, a person that is um, connected to the food chain, somebody that's very, very smart, very sharp, and um, they, they, in essence, know how to do it, when to do it, and they try to deceive others. Why is food fraud increasing and why is this such a, a big topic right now? Um, and it's really due to our increased globalization of the world food chain um, and our, our suppliers. So we're into a, uh, a time where we have very complex food supply chains, many suppliers going into our products, um, and also the forces of our economic times are very challenging. So. Um, it would create it creates the environment where there's increasing pressure um, throughout the supply chain um, for persons to commit food fraud. Um, so it's it's really I'd have to say it you know the the perfect storm for why food fraud is around and why it's it's increasing. At this time, um, Simon, we're going to do a poll question, if you could, please. Yeah, I've loaded the poll in the sidebar. Was your company ever involved in an incident related to food fraud? Uh, we're looking for lo a lot of no's, hopefully. Uh, if you were, uh, type in the chat bar, no names, uh, no business names or, or anything like that, no details, just what, what was the fraud related to? Uh, that would be interesting supplementary information. So <clears throat> everybody, please vote yes or no. And those that vote yes, if you could, just type a comment in the sidebar. So I don't know if you can see that, um, Kathleen. Uh, we've got 90% at no and 10% at yes. Um, now let's see uh, if there are any comments. Okay. Olive, uh, olive oil, Richard. Okay. Uh, uh, recently discovered someone repackaging our products into their bags and reselling without our knowledge. Oh, that's Angie. Uh, mislabeling, Greg. Uh, Julia, we have had to ask suppliers about that incident with China and spices. Uh, Amy, yes, meat grading. Peter, sudden, sudden red, color adulteration. Bruce, sewing needles inserted into shelf stable sources. Um, oh, that, that's not fraud, is it? Uh, inserting uh, um, needles into shelf stable sources. So, yeah, sewing needles. That's more of a malicious. Uh, am I right there, uh, Kathleen? You're correct. <laughs> yeah. Ivo, relabeling, date coding fraud. Flavoring meat, horse, fish, repackaging and so selling them on, falsifying brick dust instead of paprika, Bruce. Wow. wow. Michelle Peterson, baker's yeast, cumin with almond, melamine in pet food. Wow. Allegations of plastics and rice. Escala claimed label to be white tuna. Well, it, I mean, I'm I'm amazed actually that it's so right. And I can see the chat; it's just going on and on. So, yeah. so we yeah. and, and as somebody else stated here, and myself, I love the honesty to this and what um, what we're really faced with. Um, and I'll I'll get into in some of these um, that they're speaking about specifically and how they're 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 incorporated into into food fraud. Um, so it's, the poll was pretty, um, pretty interesting in that the level of food fraud is estimated to be 10% of all commercially sold foods. So it is, um, it is out there and 10% is, is of course way too, too big and Fraud can result in a, you know, either a food safety incident or a public health risk that could be 
have significant financial public relations consequences for the industry, a segment of the industry, or especially the company. And it's said um, that the cost to the global food industry is estimated um, with food fraud to be in, um, I've seen a couple different stats between 10 and 20 um, or 30 to 40 billion. So it is huge. The cost of one incident alone um, could be between two to 15% of a company's annual revenue and 400 million impact for a large, let's say $10 billion company or um, a 600 million impact for a small $500 million company. So there is a lot going on with, um, with food fraud. So we all have to be very much aware of this. Um, and again, EMA, the economically modif modified adulterants, motivated adulterants, I'm sorry. Um, here's a, a graph where you can see from the National Center for Food Protection and Defense where it lists the, um, the highest um, adulterated products and the origin of it. Um, so the heavy dark line is adulterated or originated in the U.S. and the lighter gray is adulterated originated outside the U.S. And, you know, to be surprised, and in some of this, and you'll see in the different, I'll show different um, measurements of this, um, comes into account the ability to track and detect this also. And it, um, of course, it's not the persons that are involved in this fraudulent activity, but it's um, companies and testing that is involved with the detection of this. So fish and seafood being the highest um, dairy products. And I know that from the poll and from the comments, I can see oils, fats, meat products, um, even alcoholic beverages, um, which is um, something down to, of course, coffees and teas. And another um, schematic here from the National Center for Food Protection and Defense, the NCFPB, on the incident database, um, you can see the majority being the fish seafood products, the substitution of um, lower commodity fish for the higher end, followed by oils and fats at 10% um, meat. And you can just take a gander at this chart here, but again, um, looking at all the different categories that are that are affected by food fraud. The economic um, adulteration by location produced, and again, this needs to be taken into account the capability of um, actually detecting these. And um, according to to this, um, the NCFPD, um, it's the United States again at about 30% of um, what's detected, China at 13.6, followed by India at 12.6. And you can read the other countries um, around adulteration. What are the different types of food fraud? So I'm gonna get into how to categorize food fraud. So the different types, and I'll start at um, the 12 o'clock hour um, with the substitution. And this is when, um, some examples of this, when product is substituted, um, so sunflower oils partially substituted with mineral oil. So again, finding a lower cost um, commodity to substitute for the commodity that's being sold. Concealment, um, poultry injected with hormones to conceal a disease. Um, harmful food coloring applied fresh to cover defects. So again, this is a, um, a product that normally would not be sold and it's being masked by some um, other entry of product. Um, mislabeling. Um, it could be an expired product, um, might be of an unsafe origin, mislabeled, recycled. Um, in the gray market, the production theft, diversion, sale of excess, unreported product. Um, actually, and I think one of the, I saw in the 
actual chat bar um, diversion of product. When I was working in the industry, um, worked for the NutraSuite company for many years as um, the food safety manager, quality assurance manager in the plant in um, Chicago. Actually, I was affected by this when we had our retail product um, that we sell to the big um, food service um, and retailers that have the little, um, where they sell, sell actually the equal sweetener and they were diverting our large um, food service boxes and packaging those into consumer products boxes and selling them on the on the shelves. So they were they're doing that for economical date gain, taking a lower priced um, per each um, sweetener packet and packaging into um, consumer product packages and selling it. Um, so it caused a lot of big headaches. So I was involved myself in um, finding that and having to, you know, protect the interests of the company. We also have unprotected enhancements, use of unauthorized additives, and everybody knows about the sudan dyes and spices, or the um, melamine added to enhance the protein value, um, counterfeiting, copies of popular food, um, not only clothing, but happens in food, not produce acceptable safety assurance and selling them into the retail chain. Dilution, and this is when product is watered down by um, could be non potable or potable water. Um, and it's um, again diluting um, the, the product, adding water, which is um, of lesser cost, and selling it into the market. Um, John Spink, and, and this comes from MSU, um, their definitions of food fraud, adulteration, component of the finished product is fraudulent, tampering. Legitimate product and packaging are used in a fraudulent way. If you have overrun, it could be a legitimate product is made in excess production agreements and then sold back into the industry. Theft um, product is stolen, passed off as legitimately procured product, um, diversion. And that is uh, the example I gave you that affected myself um, where they were diverting product from our supply chain, um, bigger, bigger boxes, um, less cost into consumer product boxes. Simulation, illeg illegitimate product is designed to look like, but not exactly copy the legitimate product. And counterfeiting, and that's where all aspects of the fraudulent product and packaging are being fully rec replicated. Types of food fraud, again, different definitions. I won't go through all these, um, but again, you can see that there is not um, a common um, language or one place where you get the um, definitions, but they're all very similar. Um, again, dilution, looking at the replacement addition of alternate food product, um, artificial enhancement, the addition of an unapproved chemical additive, and the examples of these are in the right-hand column, mislabeling, intentional misrepresentation with respect to quality, harvesting, or processing techniques and um, examples of that. Transshipment, origin masking, misrepresentation of the geographic origin of a product through false declaration of customs, documents or mislabeling. Um, so product designed designation of origin fraud. So um, the origin um, where the product was originally produced. Um, whether it be in one country or another, where, where that is um, mislabeled. Types of food fraud, replacement, again, um, just going through some of these examples and you could read these yourself, um, but there's a lot of information here as far as um, the replacement, the subtype, what false declaration of geographic species, um, addition of melanin to milk and examples, cow's milk for sheep, goat's milk, substitution of synthetically produced vanillin for bio, botanical derived uh, vanillin. So um, the list just goes on and on. Um, addition, addition of non authentic substance to mask inferior quality. Um, it could be a color enhancement, a taste enhancement, 
and there's some examples there. Um, addition of sugar to mask the um, per quality tasting of pomegranate juice. So again, um, the formulations, the specifications are not being followed. Again, um, this is another graph from around economic motivated adulteration um, where substitution um, has the highest incidence followed by dilution and artificial enhancements. So you can look on all these websites. Um, most of them are publicly available on the internet um, and find the incident rate. And this is a good piece of information to bring into your risk matrix, which I'll get into later in the presentation around um, information um, about the products that you're producing. Again, an, um, another graph of the EMA incidence um, where substitution dilution is the greatest um, percentage, 65%, um, followed by unapproved additives being added, um, mis counterfeiting, mislabeling. How does um, certification schemes um, look at um, food fraud? And version seven of the guidance document the document that all these standards in the GFSI are benchmarked against um, will be coming out here very quickly. Actually, it was to come out um, last year and it um, was delayed a bit, um, but working on that team that wrote the actual um, guidance document and working with the experts in the, the industry, um, food, food defense and food fraud will be incorporated into all the scopes of the GFSI. And in food fraud, the vulnerability assessments um, will be required, and also the food fraud vulnerability control plan will be required. Um, I do not have, and I apologize for this, but it's, it's too soon to have all the um, information from all the standards and the exact um, changes they're, they're making, um, but from the benchmark document, and this was even back in 2014, GFSI's position about food fraud would have, which really was announced around the same time um, of the GFSI conference in Anaheim to 2014, um, where this GFSI board decided that the standards shall require the organization to have a document food fraud vulnerability assessment in place to identify potential vulnerability and prioritize food fraud vulnerability control measures and a food fraud vulnerability control plan. Um, the standards shall require the organization to have a documented plan in place that specifies the control measures of the organization um, to minimize public health risks or identified food fraud vulnerabilities. And this plan shall cover the relevant GFSI scope and shall be supported by the organization's food safety management team. So um, in BRC, this was actually the version seven from 2015. And again, the standards are um, being updated now to be re-benchmarked against the new version seven of the um, guidance document. So this may change a little bit, but um, you can see what was in already um, the, around the company's senior management shall have a system to place, in place to ensure that the site is kept informed and reviews going on the risk to the authenticity of raw materials. Um, the company shall undertake a document risk assessment of each material to identify potential risks. Systems shall be in place to minimize the risk of purchasing fraudulent or adulterated food raw materials and to ensure that all product descriptions and claims are legal, accurate, and verified. And it goes on and on. Um, so you can see the from the standard owner perspective, um, the um, requirements that are being set. And again, these will be tweaked a little bit with the new um, benchmark document coming out and they'll be re-benchmarked, but food fraud is very prevalent. Looking at IFS um, 4.4.1, the company shall control purchasing processes to ensure that all externally sourced materials, services, which have an impact on food safety and quality, conform to requirements and the purchased products shall be checked in accordance with the specifications and their authenticity based on hazard analysis and assessment associated risks. So again, IFS um, looking at um, food fraud and th again, this was at the, 
the current version. Okay, moving on to risk mitigation in food protection and vulnerability assessments. I'm gonna start off again, um, Simon, with a poll here um, to the participants, whether food fraud is included in their food safety management system. Okay, um, rather than a poll, you'll have to just type straight in the sidebar. Um, so just type yes, no, I don't know, or not applicable, and we'll sort of roughly calculate it as they zoom past. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so sounds good. Look. Let's have a look. Uh, right. I see a lot of yeses. I do, yeah in progress some um, I, I would estimate I, I don't know if you might agree with this or not uh, I'd say about 60 percent yes uh, and then let's say um, 30 percent no and then 10 I don't know or in progress would you go for that 60 percent yes 30% no, and then 10% no, uh, I don't know, are in progress. Yes, I, 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 I can agree to that. The majority, the majority, I would say, just more than half, I, I have got um, food fraud included in the food safety management system. Very good. That's, that's, okay. that's very good to know. Um, again, with the GFSI, um, food fraud, and vulnerability assessment should be part of your food safety management system. Um, just like HACCP, um, every HACCP, HACCP including the hazards and prevention of unintentional adult, accidental adulteration, which is science-based. Um, then we moved into food defense and TASAP around threats, prevention of intentional adulteration. Um, and ideologically motivated to vulnerability assessments now, prevention of intentional adulterated, economically motivated. So um, a lot of questions I get from being a, um, a CB and managing with the auditors and our clients is how do how are auditors, how do they know and what, what do they actually look for in their the audits? And um, the auditors are required to make sure companies have a plan in place. So they're, they're not um, food fraud um, experts. They're not expected to find fraud or detect fraud, but they're to affirm that the program is capable of preventing fraud. Um, so again, it's looking at, um, you know, whether the company has a plan in place. And they can detect, they can, um, Good auditors can find where there's, there's gaps, but again, um, the auditor is not, a, let's say, a per se, a GFSI um, expert um, on, on food fraud or detecting it. So looking at food fraud vulnerability assessments, um, what, what is all involved? Um, taking in um, the technological situation, um, having to do with the product itself, um, what is the product you're selling, the characteristics of that product, um, looking at the company environment. Food fraud can also happen um, internal to your company um, for economic gain. You know, the, the climate, the, the people that are working for you, um, the organization, um, is it a, you know, a, a, a nice place to work at or, um, you know, disgruntled, <coughs> excuse me, disgruntled employees. Um, the stakeholder environment, um, the legal framework you have with your suppliers and supply chain, how well you know your suppliers, um, looking at the global um, company circumstances, who you're selling to and um, how you're looked at and the company's fraud measurements, um, your control measures, both from the technology and the people control measures. So all of this um, landscape goes into your fraud vulnerability. If you look at um, PASS 96, um, there's different approaches 
to food fraud mitigation and PAST 96, um, which is a publicly available specification um, written in 2014, is a guide to protecting and defending food and drink from deliberate attacks. So it's it has um, information in it um, around food fraud. Um, I might get into the actual threat um, CCP process and outlining the process. So for those that are familiar with um, HACCP, um, TASCP is, is similar in a way um, in that it's a team that's included in this. It's not one person. It's not the food safety manager alone. It's not a, um, a safety manager, but it's a, a cross-functional team across your organization to assess the information that's available um, to identify the threats to the organi organization, to identify and assess the threats to the operation, um, a product is selected, um, identifying and assessing the threats to the product, um, of course, devising a good flow chart of the product supply chain, which is, um, to me, the most important, really understanding your supply chain, identifying key staff um, and vulnerable points, considering the impact of the threats identified, ad identifying which supply points are most critical, Determining if a control procedure will detect the threat, the likelihood versus the impact, the prioritization of these. Um, you might come up with many, many, but again, um, the risk matrix, matrix must play a part here. Identify who could carry it out, decide and implement necessary controls. Review and revise um, in the Good Plan Do Check Act um, here. Um, monitor horizon scans and emerging risks. So um, this is something you need to keep current too. Um, threats might, your the risk matrix might change um, having to do with um, different things going on around the, the world. So you just need to um, really stay on top of this. Um, some questions to ask um, yourself in threat analysis critical control points. Are there a lower cost substitute material available? Um, I won't go through all these. In um, you can read these. Has pressure increased on the supplier's trading margins? Do you trust your supplier's managers? Do you have a good relationship with them? Do key suppliers use personnel security practices? So these are things that can be picked up in supplier audits um, in, in many of the standards that are used in the industry. Um, are we supplied through remote obscure chains? Um, has there been unexpected increase or decreases in demand? How do suppliers dispose of excess amounts of waste materials? Do they have um, good destruction um, mechanisms that they're defacing product and um, they have that whole chain um, clearly defined? Are, are you aware of any shortcuts to the process which could affect them? So really, um, knowing your suppliers are very, very important with us. And looking at different um, ways of looking at the risk, um, I'll go through a couple of these that are available. And, and again, I'm giving you um, different ideas on risk matrixing. And this is where the impact and likelihood are um, looked at and um, categorizing whether there's from a negligible risk all the way to a very high risk based upon um, a risk scoring matrix. So this is a good example of um, how to prioritize. As far as um, looking at another one, input information, um, looking at historical incidents, is it a um, commodity that has history behind it? that has been already um, modified, um, looking at pl price fluctuations, the economic um, conditions, looking at the complexity of the supply chain, how many hands is this raw material or, or packaging um, going through before it gets to your um, production facility, um, looking at the back end, the storage and distribution of your finished goods, Picking out a couple here, existing controls, including routine testing, audits. Um, are you auditing your 
supply chain? Do you know um, all your suppliers? And especially with FISMA and the preventative controls, um, knowing um, with the, now we've got both FISMA and GFSI requiring food products and distributors to, to address economic mo motivations. Um, so it's, it's, it's very much uh, no longer a, uh, nice to have it's 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 a requirement here's some great websites that i've listed here um, that has a wealth of information um, that you can get input information about um, your environment um, that you're working in your your supply chain um, if you spend a little time on these websites you can find a lot um, current information about um, what is going on and how um, the different food protection associations are, um, are tracking these incidents. Get, getting back to BRC and GFSI, um, oops, I'm sorry, let me go back to this. The BRC, um, they're suggesting using a quadratic model and different than some, than some of these other ones I've seen. Um, severity is not a particularly useful measure to the BRC as they're looking at the resultant product. Um, if it's mod modified, will always be illegal. Therefore, the consequences are always severe. So you can see that they're looking at the likelihood of detection on the y-axis versus the likelihood of occurrence as their risk, risk matrix. So again, um, likelihood of detection um, is looking at the probability instead of the severity. Again, another risk matrix here, prioritizing um, numbers from 1 to 125, looking at the occurrence and the detection and profitability of um, this to occur. So again, different ways of looking at the risk. Vulnerability self-assessment tools are out there. Um, the best way, and it's hard to want to do this, but it's a necessity, is to think like a criminal. Um, what, what, based on criminology, what is there that could happen? Um, there's questionnaires out there assessing both the internal and external environment of a company, opportunities, motivation, control measures. Um, you can result in a spider web graph, um, looking at the motivation opportunities, looking at your control measures along assessment of adequacy in the level of vulnerability. Example questions of a self-assessment, um, how simple or complex is adulteration of your raw materials? Easy adulteration, the comp composition of the raw material provides opportunities for potential offenders to commit fraud. So if you have a raw material that um, looks to be easy to adulterate that um, might not be de detected visually or in testing, um, you know, what is the risk to that? And you can look at the answers here, going from composition material cannot be modified or replaced, um, such things as fruits, um, down to the composition of raw material can be modified by mixing with lower quality or foreign material powders, ground meat, and I saw in one of the comments, um, um, dust was added um, into some sort of spice. Um, so creativity in the criminal's minds really occur here. And there's a good source of information. I've got the website listed here. And what kind of competence needed um, you know, to detect this? Usually good um, laboratory analysis. Self-assessment, um, another example, how would you describe the financial strains imposed by your own company on your direct suppliers? So um, financial strains imposed by your company on your direct suppliers can actually motivate the supplier to commit fraud, um, to drive costs down in their production. Um, and you can see the answers there going from fixed prices for direct suppliers in line with market all the way to the company typically buys from suppliers that offer the lowest price. And looking at um, management and procurement to um, assess this. 
how extensive is the information system for internal controls of mass balance flows in your company. So again, um, looking at this, you can read this as far as the um, different answers here and the competence needed. Um, again, the finance group would need to look at this. I'm going to go through these and I'm taking longer than I expected. I'm going to go through these pretty, pretty quickly, but I'm going to show you some um, things to look at in your supply chain, your audit strategy, the relationship you have with your suppliers, testing frequency, fraud history, and I'll, um, everybody will get copies of this presentation, so I'll go through this pretty quickly, but there's a lot of information here to cover. But um, looking at your supply chain and the contribution to vulnerability, if it's, um, if you, if it's low, you have a vertically integrated, um, your raw materials are produced by your own company. Um, the ingredient is not sourced from third parties. Again, that's very low to the extreme of high open market. The scenario is described in the situation which the ingredient is sourced in the open market and none of the other scenarios described above can be verified as being applicable. So again, reading these and looking at your supply chain, deciding which, what is your, what is your company situation? Is it low or is it high? Looking at your audit strategy, um, a low risk, you have a robust on-site audit um, with anti-fraud measures um, to no on-site audits. And again, looking at this from the supply chain too, do you audit your suppliers? Um, do you know them? Um, are they implementing risk mitigation measures? Two, and I talked about this a little bit before the supplier relation, do you have trusted suppliers um, where you purchase your ingredients to, do you have unestablished suppliers and no prior relationship? History of the supplier and quality and safety incidents. Um, again, looking at the information that you can gather um, from low, you, you don't know of any issues in your supplier history to there's been strong evidence of quality and safety concerns, and um, there's inadequate controls. Testing frequency um, from low, where you have intense every lot tested, to high, where you're accepting a certificate of analysis, and either not present or not specific to lot shipments, and there's no independent testing. So we'll I'll get into the um, laboratory analysis a little bit, so I'll skip on to this. But here's a case. Um, you have powdered whey protein, and in the specification for total crude protein, it's to not to have less than 90%. And it's tested by a well-known um, nitrogen method, which is internally or internationally recognized method for protein content. Vulnerability to adulteration, is it low, medium, or high? Oh, in this case, by testing just with the one method, um, I would say it's a high vulnerability to the adulteration, lacking the selectivity and specificity of that test method. Um, it could I, I, it fails in that it does not identify non-whey protein nitrogen alter, adulterants such as vegetable proteins and other high nitri nitrogenous compounds. So again, you need to really have somebody that's um, uh, very analytically astute to the test methods and don't be um, fall behind the testing that you're doing um, to detect everything. Another case though is powdered whey protein, um, same specification, but you can see the different testing methodologies being used on, on top of the nitrogen method, the amino acid fingerprinting, um, high HPLC method for lactose weight loss on drying test, and oh, sorry about that. The vulnerability um, considered medium low or low vulnerability um, because of the different test methodologies that are being used. Um, the other thing, um, I mean, there's a whole science behind the testing to looking at um, the first one here, the comparison of what I call REV-A, and this is actually 
a compound that is 200 times sweeter than sugar versus pomegranate juice. So looking at the composition of the product itself, um, is it simple and it's not variable in the first example of the sweetener? Um, and then the testing power is the um, it's used to encompass the concepts of the analytical method, the selectivity, specificity, specificity and sensitivity. Um, so you've got a case where the product is, um, the composition is uniform and the testing is, is good. You're, you probably can detect um, that product um, if there's vulnerability um, to fraud versus the pomegranate juice where you have a complex variable product and you the two test methods you're using um, hunter colorimetry or the, the bricks, which is a sugar content of a solution, um, which is pretty weak testing to, and the vulnerability for that might be higher. Um, so these are just other examples to vulnerability that I've listed and I'm not gonna go through these in essence of time here, but um, one thing that we face nowadays is the geopolitical considerations of different countries and where you're getting where you're sourcing your materials from. Um, again, the fraud history, very important. Um, if it happened before, the likelihood of it occurring again, um, economic anomalies, and won't go into this too much, the impact assessment, looking at food safety, economic impact, and there could even be um, multipliers to it. Um, that you need to look at. So again, um, a lot of good information here for you to assess your own company risk against. Risk mitigation control measures, um, critical control points, um, looking at your incoming material control system, um, your raw materials, do you have documented procedure records, detailed specifications, anti-fraud items, analytical testing strategies, anti-tampering, packaging or tampering evidence seals, um, your end product control, you have document procedures, relevant records, detailed specifications, including fraud items, and analytical testing strategies. So um, vulnerability assessments again in the control plans. Um, for your assessment, put yourself in the mindset of thinking like a criminal, um, but then your control plan, monitoring strategies, and looking at um, the different things you can do to um, mitigate that. As far as analytical testing, um, you know, is more testing the best solution? Um, how much money do you do you want to invest in testing your products? Um, detecting fraud, looking at um, look targeted analysis the list of targeted components, or if you're going after the fingerprinting of non-targeted analysis, and this is um, a complete profile, um, where you're finding also what you're not looking for. So the different types of analytical testing to be done. Um, and again, target analysis, some different methodologies here, um, GC, LC, mass spec, um, NMR, um, DNA analysis, and then non-targeted um, analysis with um, looking at the study of proteins or nuclear magnetic resonance. And again, um, look at your testing, why you're doing that, um, what, what your product is, um, the frequency of your testing, the vulnerability of your, um, the points in the supply chain, but really understanding um, what and why you are testing and where. Here's an example of um, uh, NMR, um, nuclear magnetic resonance, where the detection and for each, um, there's a fingerprint for each product. So here and for each peak, it shows um, the fingerprint for the product. So cysteine was detected, um, indicating addition of a protein hydrolysate from hair feathers. So they were substituting um, hair feathers in this, this product. So um, the, every little different um, peak here, um, every product should have a fingerprint. And um, with 
different technologies, you can identify where there is um, different peaks that should not be there. And that is because of um, different um, additions that might have been made. Traceability system, um, traceability management, data management system, look at mass balance, personnel management, your documented code of ethics, um, do you have a whistleblowing place, system in place, do you have ethical, highly valued, rewarded management? Um, so you can go through these suppliers, do you have fixed pricing for suppliers in alignment markets? Um, do you have relevant certification schemes widely implemented within your supply chain network? Verification improvement, the food fraud prevention system included in your is internal in your internal audit program. So make sure you're verifying um, what is going on and making improvements um, that it's in your management review meetings based upon your internal audits. Um, I won't really go into the European legislation, but um, there's again just in detail here, summarized in a nutshell, there's no definition of food fraud, um, but there's the national laws in the EU state provides various definitions for facts that represent a certain type of violation of statutory agri food chain requirements, and they are qualified by the intention to deceive and motivate by the prospect of financial and economic gain. So very similar to what I've covered already. Um, they've got some an action plan here um, that is was in wake of the horse meat incident scandal that I think everybody knows about a couple years ago um, and what they're doing about it. And the commission has decided to activate a dedicated network of administrative assistant liaison bodies, um, the food fraud contact points and the food fraud network. And I know I covered a lot of material and we're almost out of time here, um, but I don't know how, and there's a, a list of questions here, so, so I don't know how to address this. So, well, few, <laughs> few, Kathleen. Uh, do you want to uh, stop sharing your uh, PowerPoint now and come on webcam? Uh, you, you were probably seeing in the chat bar that it's been the comments and the questions have been rolling and not just comments and questions, the answers as well. Um, so this will help in each. You might have a few less questions. Uh, well, yeah, fantastic. You've, you've got through a mass of information there. And obviously, everybody will get a copy of the presentation. Yeah. And th there's lots of uh, reading to digest to look through again, but also lots of links to great resources there as well that you've provided. So thanks very much, Kathleen. Brilliant. OK. OK, let's see Thank if we can you. just pick up a few questions. I know if anybody's got to go at 4 o'clock because you've allocated an hour, we're going to carry on for five or ten minutes. It is recorded, so you can, if you miss, miss it, okay, then uh, Chet, let's see, uh, Chet is saying the question of testing, is it the best option to detect and deter? Would it be better to blacklist the suppliers across the GFSI schemes, for example, as suppliers not to use? Would this reduce the cost of testing, which can become exorbitant, especially for smaller companies? Um, and that, that would be <laughs> that would be a possibility. I um, knowing the GFSI board, I, I do not know if that was you know in their 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 scope of decision making to to blacklist um, suppliers. But of course, that would be a way of. Um, Deterring that, and in yeah, being got, in the industry yeah. for many years, the collaboration that is going on and the different groups, um, you know, know know your industry partners because, and even your competition because, you know, the way that you can share information not through the GFSI but through industry meetings, it would be, um, you know, likely you could find out about um, different issues. Okay, yeah, it's no supplier control and supplier monitoring and all of the specifications and the compliance there's no shortcut to it uh, Eddie is saying can food fraud risk be integrated with HACCP and somebody else asked that earlier Kathleen VASAP, TASAP, HACCP how do we 
document that in our system uh, effectively and efficiently? Um, my answer as a food safety professional is yes. Um, if you're going, if you're going into um, the same teams, the same methodologies um, are used. Um, if you're GFSI um, certified by one of the benchmark standards, I would really look at when they come out with the new additions, specifically what their requirements are. Separate um, plan, um, but um, I. It's not a necessity. Um, if the standard says they have a separate um, plan written, then of course you'll have to have one. Um, it's going to be done together, definitely, definitely. Okay, okay. Uh, Isabel, uh, in in the event of fraud, do you legally have to replace the logs? Are you obliged to report it fraud? That's a question I, I, I honestly um, will have to get back to that um, person about the legal parts of that. And um, maybe what I can do is let me let me check into that um, very quickly and I can get that answer because um, I want to make yeah. sure it is. Um, and it might be different per, per country. So yeah, let, me, let me get, a good, let me get um, a, a good answer for that. I'll know that. Yeah, I know there are obli obligations to report calls and things like that in, in certain countries. Um, but free fraud, it would be a good idea though. Um, yeah, yes. Okay. Uh, let's see. For any kind of information, may we have your email? Well, it will be, I think your contact details are at the last slide of the presentation. Is that right, Kathleen? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. When we issue that, you can pick up uh, Kathleen's contact details um, from the slides. Uh, lots of thank you. Any more questions uh, while we've got Kathleen online? I mean, what, what we'll do is um, I'll download the chat and I'll email it to you, Kathleen, as well. Okay. And if there are any questions, I can put you in touch directly with, you know, with certain individuals who uh, might have asked a question that you can follow up with. Um, okay, I think, I mean, what it says this is that uh, we could perhaps um, do do another related to food fraud in, in the future, uh, but perhaps more specific, um, probably two hours would have been uh, more. <laughs> yes. yes, yes, a lot of information to cover. Just a lot of thank yous and looking forward to receiving the slides and helpful links. Um, any ideas for mitigation uh, for um, spices? Anything specific, or is it more general with systems? Yeah, it's really general with systems. But I I know from um, the spices and working with um, some of our clients, it's it's one of their major concerns um, and what what is being done in the supply chain. Um, I, I see a lot of activity especially in, even in auditing of suppliers um, coming from it, India um, is a, a country of where we get a lot of spices from into the US. So there's a lot of supplier audits being done there. So I'd say supplier audits would be one, one form of the mitigation there. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, food fraud is a criminal activity and there are criminals and people where there's money involved, people will try to, to make easy money and yes. you just got to protect yourself, just like you protect your home with locks and alarms and things like that. You, this, you just have to do it. Um, well, Olamide, what do you do in case your organisation is involved in such practices? That's a difficult one. Yes. Yeah. A difficult one. Uh, Thank you for the comments right. here too. Yeah, amazing. Uh, Mario, can a manufacturer operate an effective TASAP or VASAP system without the little testing? How do you think? Yeah, without the um, analytical testing. I would, if my auditors would answer, they always, it depends. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's hard to give a great answer on that. 
that's the ultimate uh, verification, I suppose, isn't it? The, the yes. testing. Um, you can put all the uh, blocking and checking procedures in place, but ultimately some testing might. You obviously can't 100% test, but you obviously need some. Uh, Maria, when your supplier is a trader and does not have GFSI and it does not tell you who their suppliers are, what do you do? Can you can you repeat that? Uh, I yeah, Maria is saying, uh, asking, uh, when your supplier is a trader and does not have GFSI and it does not tell you who the supplier, what can you do? So, so you're basically buying from a trader and you don't know the suppliers and you can't get any details. What, what do you do in that case? I mean, that's that's a risk that you're you're taking in and you've got to um, look at that, how that how that weighs out in the GFSI. Um, you, know, you might look at the broker standards um, that GFSI has, um, you know, look, look, understand and know your your trader in the broker because you're putting a lot of, um, you know, credibility in, in them, but really understand them, know them. Um, they they need to have some knowledge of who they're they're buying from and yeah I mean uh, obviously you can threat threaten to move your supplies somewhere else it depends sometimes it's a bit difficult if you if there, there are not many suppliers or traders available a small customer of theirs you don't um, right I think uh, We've, we've, we're seven minutes past. I think what we'll do is we'll collect these. I'll, I'll email these to you, Kathleen, and, and maybe okay. we can do it that way. So on behalf of uh, myself, Duen, and all the attendees today, there's been well over 400 people live today. And anybody who watches this in the future, thank you, Kathleen Wyborn from DNV. Thank you. Hope to see you again soon, Kathleen. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Right, the last thing uh, to do is to uh, give your your certificate. So I'll load that in the sidebar. Um, click that button, download certificate. You'll be taken to a page there where you can click another button and go to drop certificate and print it. Um, if you don't get it, I will be following up with an email with the slides, the, the webinar recording and the certificate. Uh, next week, we've got the Smart Objectives with Vladimir Sachinsky. Uh, so, hope to see you there. Uh, and between now and then, uh, have a lovely Friday and uh, enjoy your weekend, and we'll see you soon. Take care.